precise technical solutions to make Israelis, Palestinians, and the region safer and much more prosperous. plan. It is a war plan because this legalized the occupation. This plan legalized the settlements. This plan legalized the annexation of Jerusalem. This plan says no return for the Palestinian refugees. You know, we are the oppressed and they are the oppressors. And they, they want the oppressed to give more to the oppressor. They want the oppressed to be oppressed more. What would you do? You would just leave your houses for money, leave your land, leave your life, your memories, your history for money? But the deal of the century, the Trump so-called peace plan, which the Israelis and the United States of America claim will bring peace to the Middle East, but the Palestinians outright reject and say is an attack on their national identity as well as their land. I'm Robert in Lakesh, and I've come here to occupied Palestine to investigate what the so-called deal of the century means for the Palestinian people and the future of Palestine. Following the official release of the controversial plan proposed to end the Palestine-Israel conflict, an escalation of violence ensued in occupied Palestine as Israeli occupation forces brutally attacked Palestinian demonstrators, only to strengthen the resolve of the Palestinian national resistance. Being on the ground in Palestine, I lived through this round of violence, witnessing vivid scenes of brutality, racist hate crimes, and the murder of Palestinians. But before we investigate this further, we have to first look at the past to understand how things got to where they are today. The peace process between Palestinians and Israelis, as it is often referred to, was officially initiated with the signing of the Oslo Accords in 1993. When PLO leader Yasser Arafat signed the agreement with the Israelis, it was supposed to lead to the establishment of a Palestinian state and the ending of hostilities between Palestinians and Israelis. However, a Palestinian state, as well as peace in the Middle East, never came. Instead, the Oslo Accords had meant for the newly established Palestinian Authority that they had accepted an exclusively Jewish ethno-state on 78% of their historic homeland and received nothing in return. Five years after the signing of the Oslo Accords, the occupation of the West Bank and Gaza was even more deeply entrenched as Israeli settlements expanded on Palestinian land. The only difference on the ground, as peace talks had been ongoing, was that there had been further theft of Palestinian West Bank resources, the besiegement of Gaza, and the bombardment of the Gaza Strip. All of this whilst the Palestinian Authority, based in Ramallah, had acted to protect Israeli security interests. Then, following the second Palestinian uprising in 2000, the illegal separation wall was later built in 2002 in the West Bank, usurping approximately 10% of the territory, also collectively punishing 150 Palestinian communities who were disconnected from their lands, according to the human rights group Betselem. 
Settlements continued expanding and the further confiscation of land and resources from Palestinians ensued, with illegal religious extremist Israeli settlers seizing Palestinian homes in East Jerusalem as well as in the West Bank. All of this being justified by the Israeli claim the Palestinian terrorists had to be subdued and Israel's security had to be protected. Now, Donald Trump's self-proclaimed roadmap to peace would essentially allow for Israel to take half of the West Bank, annexing the most fertile agricultural lands, aquifers, and prohibiting Palestinians from having an army or any real autonomy. It would also connect Palestinian Bantu stance together via underground tunnels. Upon arriving in occupied Palestine, I had traveled to the village of Kafin near Tolkaram, where an unarmed 19-year-old boy named Badr was shot in the neck and killed by Israeli occupation forces for protesting against the deal of the century. Unfortunately, this was not the last funeral that I attended of young people and children who had been murdered in the West Bank. However, they all resembled each other roughly. Palestinian family members grieving, the look of disbelief on a broken mother's face, and the cries from the village for a day where the martyrdom of their brother or sister will enable a free Jerusalem al-Quds, a belief that gives meaning to the life of those martyred. Al-Quds is at the heart of every Palestinian. It is holy to both Muslim and Christian Palestinians who are currently unable to visit if they live in the West Bank, Gaza Strip, or Palestinian diaspora. The international consensus for a solution to the Israel-Palestine conflict states that East Jerusalem is to be the capital of the future Palestinian state. This, however, is not what is being allocated to the Palestinians under the Trump Netanyahu vision. Instead, they are confining the capital of the Palestinian people to outside the separation walls of Jerusalem al-Quds. I'm standing here in Abu Dis, the proposed capital for the Palestinian people. And of course, Abu Dis here is a suburb just outside of mainland Jerusalem al-Quds. And what we see here in Abu Dis is the apartheid system in the West Bank at its most clearest. We see over here behind us Palestinian villages, Jerusalemites, separated from their brethren and their lands on the other side of the wall over here. People who have been separated so that they cannot see their family members, that they cannot come and farm their lands, and of course separated by this wall. If this was to be accepted as the capital of Palestine, that would mean not only would it be this little slither of land, which would not include the old city of Jerusalem al-Quds, but it means that it will be a symbol of the oppression of the Palestinian people. And for them to live like this, seeing every single day what could have been, and Jerusalem al-Quds with Masjid al-Aqsa and the Dome of the Rocks in the background, is utter pain and struggle. The separation of Jerusalemite Muslims and Christians from Jerusalem al-Quds is rarely ever shown on mainstream Western television. And so, before you travel to the West Bank, one would imagine that the situation is completely different from the reality faced here. What my cameraman and I witnessed on the Palestinian side of Israel's wall was the humiliation of Palestinians on a daily basis and a space allocated for a capital which would hardly drive tourism to a country with its depressing scenery, bringing with it a feeling of walking around in an open air prison. Even on the other side of the wall, Palestinian homes are constantly being demolished and stolen by Israeli settlers, as Donald Trump emboldens their actions with the decree that Israel's undivided capital is to be Jerusalem al-Quds. The justification given by Israel for such disturbing realities imposed on the ground is that what has been imposed is for Israel's security. But even if that was the truth behind the occupation and violations of international law, this excuse was not accepted internationally by the court of public opinion when it came to apartheid South African whites. So why is it reasonable coming from Israeli Jews, I ask? But the issue of division isn't the only problem facing the Palestinians. 
there is also the problem of where the two divided peoples would live if remaining segregated and where any viable borders could possibly exist between Palestinians and the Israelis. The issues of borders is of course made tough due to the Israeli illegal racial colonies or settlements as they're referred to. Something that you cannot escape when you come here to the West Bank is seeing and witnessing how deeply entrenched these settlements are into the Palestinian land here. Currently, over 750,000 illegal Israeli settlers live on stolen Palestinian land, equating to a land grab of 40% of the West Bank. Due to seizure of land, Palestinians currently live in 165 disconnected islands surrounded by checkpoints, military outposts, closed military zones, and settlements. What is perhaps more disturbing, however, is the fact that one of the chief architects of what is supposed to be a peace deal, Jared Kushner, has direct ties to the funding of an illegal settlement named Beit El, with almost 100,000 US dollars that we know about. Kushner is also an open supporter of illegal settlements. Understanding that under Trump's so-called peace plan, settlements will remain in place, I traveled to occupied Al Khalil, or Hebron as it's called, to meet with local human rights activist Isa Amro to learn more about what the situation would remain as in the heart of the illegal settler conflict zone. Trump plan is to make this permanent. Trump plan is about, you know, legitimizing the settlements and legitimizing this apartheid and segregation and separation and keep me without any basic human rights. He's telling us not to film, but he is here. Even we are allowed to film. He's illegal. It's because we, they don't want us to film their weakness and their truth. They don't want us to expose that Israel is an apartheid state, Israel is not a democracy, and Israel is not a state of law. It's the state of settlers, soldiers, and it's the state of apartheid and segregation. This is my home. It's not your country. Okay, that's the truth here. Yes. This is a kindergarten, an outpost, and the Israeli army closed the shops. This used to be the gold market. Yeah. Now it's their rubbish here. They broke into the shops, they stole it, and they occupied the rooftops, you know, to make it uh, comfortable for the Israeli settlers. A welfare life for the settlers on the expense of our basic. So the street is closed, all the shops are closed by military orders, and marked as closed shops. Look, it's marked, sealed, welded as a closed shop. It was closed first, 1994, after the Abraham was massacre. And what justification do they give? Why do they say they, they have to be closed? Do they give you a justification for closing it? Always, always, the false justification is security. The main reason for it, it's about confiscation and to have the Arab free zone here. Closing the city center. It's the hub of the city, you know? It's the heart of the city. They closed it and they control it and they, they drive here. We are not allowed to drive. We are not allowed to drive in our own streets. Our shops are closed. Our houses became empty. They changed the names of the streets from Palestinian Arabic name to Israeli Hebrew names. The road signs are only in English and Hebrew. Israeli flags here, they are taking our identity as Palestinian identity. And this system right here with the shops closed and everything happening under Trump's plan, this would remain closed? It will remain closed. They didn't touch it. They don't talk about it. The main entrance to the family is yes. closed. The main road is closed. And we are using the fields to reach the house here. And the family is separated and isolated alone. And the army is occupying the roof. They have a military post on the roof. The family is not allowed to go to the roof. Yeah. And they are locked inside the house. And from time to time, the settlers come to the roof, throw stones, throw rocks, throw rubbish to the family without any uh, help. Not only that, the Palestinian ambulance is not allowed to reach here without a special, special coordination. So you skip all the emergency cases. So you, you are not only seized by the army and the soldiers, you are seized from any kind of basic human rights. We continued to film until we reached a military outpost where we were at first instructed at gunpoint to go back because Palestinians could not walk on the Jewish-only street there. 
so we filmed secretly as I asked the soldier present why Aisa and my cameraman Hamdi were not able to walk on the road. Okay, so if it belongs only to Jews, then is this not racism? This is illegal settlements under international law. They, they take this. Why not one person, one vote? Why not equal rights? Because this here is like in apartheid South Africa. If you went to apartheid South Africa, you would see the same thing. And so this is racism. And racism doesn't change depending upon where you go because of security situation. It's racism. That's it. I understand what you're saying, but uh, yesterday, the day, day before, they were trying to stab people in the... Stab, but you shoot. And you arrest children. Yeah, it doesn't matter. But does that justify hurting them, killing them? I don't Occupying them? Nobody hurt them. Crazy. The soldier I just engaged with refused to speak to me until I told him I was not a Palestinian. But many other soldiers had an even more negative attitude towards us, making it clear that Palestinians or any friends of Palestinians were not welcome. After witnessing the situation in Al Khalil, I then traveled to Ramallah in order to take part in protests rejecting the deal of the century. At this protest you're seeing alone, tens of protesters were shot and many others gassed, causing them to collapse and convulse. We have an attack here on a member of the press clearly marked. As the press is of course a violation of international law, firing tear gas everywhere. He passed out unconscious. This man is marked as a press and of course is not protesting. He's here to document purely and he was targeted by the Israelis. After the demonstration, we found out following a visit to the Ramallah hospital that four young boys were shot with internationally banned bullets. Three were hit in the legs and one in the head. The protests I witnessed, however, were just the tip of the iceberg. Other demonstrations were much more violent and led to the deaths of several young Palestinians. To find out more about why Palestinian people broke out into mass protest against the deal of the century, I met with the world-renowned journalist Jana Jihad and Palestinian icon Ahed Tamimi, both locals to the village of Nabi Saleh. So since the announcement of the uh, so -called first deal of asking the Jana what she had witnessed uh, since Donald the Trump announcement of the Trump plan. As you said, are getting killed, people are getting arrested. Um, I'm facing checkpoints uh, on my way to school every day. Um, like for example, yesterday, I, ju I was just going to my school and then there was this checkpoint. You know, the checkpoints here in the West Bank are in the West Bank are not checkpoints. They're just a gate on the street. They usually close it, block the street, and then they go. They don't check the car, they just block it. So, like, I had to take another way that takes me about triple the time to get to my school. I was late to my school. Even today, we were stuck for two hours on the checkpoint. Um, every day since the deal of the century had been declared, um, you know, people, uh, there are a lot of clashes, people are getting killed, people are getting injured, and it's very sad that we um, are paying the price of something that we didn't cause. What we heard from Donald Trump was that when this deal was initially announced that there would be some sort of peace that would come out of this and that uh, the Palestinians would receive a great amount of money. I believe that legalizing what's illegal is not peace. Legalizing occupation, legalizing settlements, um, it's not what we call peace. And I don't care about money. I just want my land. I want to stay in my house. I want to go to the sea that I've never been to, which is only 30 minutes far from my house, that I can literally see every single morning from the roof of my house that I've never been to. That's what I call peace, but that's not peace, and I don't care about money. What if I came and told you I want half of America, I'd, I'd pay you, but I just want half of America? Like, what would you do? You would just leave your houses for money, leave your land, leave your life, your memories, your history for money? <laughs> 
ايش بدها تسوي في حياتها يعني اللي صار بده يعني بده يعمل مشروع بده يستنى بده يشوفه وبده بده مثلا ينضم ل... لاسرائيل ولا بده يضل تابع للسلطة الفلسطينية ولا الناس بدها بدها تعرف مثلا القرية مثلا نبي صالح بدها يعني احنا مش عارفين احنا وين بدنا نروح او مثلا احتمال كبير مثلا يجوا يحكوا لنا اطلعوا من بيوتكم او يستولوا على القرية عشان كل حواليها مستوطنات ف يعني الواحد مش عارف ايش بده يعمل مش عارف زي حياة الناس توقفت او صار في عطل بحياة الناس انه صار صارت صفقة القرن تأثر In Ramallah, I witnessed the largest demonstration the city had seen since the time of the Second Intifada, or uprising as it is known in English. What was clear to me in the West Bank was that there was a growing sense of desperation and also unity from the Palestinian people that could be felt building day by day. The desperation for action coming from the threat immediately posed to annex areas such as the Jordan Valley which is where I began to travel to next. So we've just entered the Jordan Valley here and uh, what we witnessed just as we were entering was uh, the closed military zones here and the soldiers in the fields actually aiming uh, just above children and telling them to duck, using them sort of as firing practice. And then what we also discovered as we were driving along is that two Bedouin children uh, young children who were riding on uh, donkeys were also arrested by the army. The Jordan Valley is home to 70,000 Palestinians, yet is 85% inaccessible to its people as Israel has turned the land into a military training ground and allowed for illegal settlers to come in and make goods to sell around the world. The area is under international law recognized as Palestinian land, which is to be the future agricultural hub of Palestine its undeveloped areas could also be used for energy projects, water extraction, and urban centers. One of the most important things to understand about the Jordan Valley is that this land here constitutes 30% of the West Bank and of course means the loss of the most fertile agricultural land for a potential future Palestinian state. What you can see straight away when you come here to the Jordan Valley is that the people primarily here are building their houses uh, as tents uh, and as sort of cave structures and things like this because the Israelis don't allow them here in Area C to actually build, have the permits to build homes. So if they were to actually build proper homes already before the, the land being annexed and of course these people uh, inevitably being expelled, then their homes would be bulldozed. The, the conditions that have been imposed in the plan says that there is no Palestinian state. So what will happen with us? We are here more than 50% of the population. Now every year they demolish about 500 uh, houses there. This plan says no Palestinian uh, state and no sovereignty, no borders, no water, no air, no underground. Nothing for the Palestinians. In Jordan Valley, we are 70,000 uh, Palestinians, and, in, uh, and the Israeli settlers are only 8,000. So we, are, we have to stay, and our existence there will be the main uh, factor uh, to stop the uh, century plan. It was clear from even before US President Donald Trump alongside Israeli Premier Benjamin Netanyahu announced the details of the plan that the Israeli regime sought to annex the Jordan Valley, Northern Dead Sea and illegal settlements, throwing away all the progress of work done since 1988 between Palestinians and Israelis. Looking on at the situation on the ground in Palestine, it was clear that a two-state solution looked impossible and that a one-state solution where Palestinians could live with equal rights to Israelis was a long way from coming to fruition. However, the younger generation of Palestinians served as a great source of hope that one day liberation could perhaps be in sight, 
and that the failure of the old is now being replaced by a new vision for peace coming from the young. How are you going to take away an Aqsa? This is where we pray, and you cannot disrupt us. Please stay away. Please let us discuss this. We just wanted peace, and you wanted destructive. Three brothers were killed by defending Allah's home. One was 17, 18, 20, barely grown. They're young. They're students trying to make it out from nothing. All of a sudden, they're shot, and they never made it home. Tear gas and rubber coated bullets by them. Over 1,000 people injured by them. That's just estimated. That's not even updated. Everybody was waiting just so they could pray today. But metal detectors thinking that will stay away. Islam will never change even if they change the place. This is our land, God's home, our great escape to make the eye for all the people in the past who passed away. Ameen.